what's what's there, what the age of the data is, what the risk is. So we have tools in our, our information governance suite, such as data insights, which can help you understand what uh, you know what data is, how old is it, what's the risk on that data before you then apply that to cloud. Um, a little bit of feedback up. Someone is, uh, if you're not asking questions, you don't mind muting. Uh, the, I guess then the, the question is, what is the cloud landing zone that you wish to move that data to? Uh, it could be uh, you know, a virtual machine Azure, which in which case it would be you know, fairly similar to the way your, your Windows file server is configured today with you know, AD permissions, etc. Um, or you might be looking to move it into some other cloud uh, solution like Office 365 with um, SharePoint Online, for instance. Uh, in, in which case, you know, you, you do need to then look at how do you how do you want to protect that data? So, you know, there are DLP, data loss prevention tools that you might want to wrap around. Microsoft provides a, a basic uh, capability uh, within Office 365 as an, as an add-on, um, or there are third-party security, you know, data loss prevention tools out there. Um, again, you know, our insights tools, Data Insight, can integrate with some of those tools and, uh, you know, and, and help you to manage the end-to-end -end data from, from the security perspective as well as the the visibility of, of the data content and the, and the utilization and the permissions. Brilliant, thanks, Jason. That was um, that was quite uh, uh, you know that, that was quite comprehensive to start with. So it's it's important that we know what is the type or the content and what's the risk and the compliance guideline around that piece of data before we even think of devising a strategy. Or of migrating or moving it to the cloud. So, uh, thanks, thanks for that question. All right, I will uh, take the next question now. So the next question we have is, and I would want uh, Jeff to help us and give his leadership perspective. So Jeff, the next question here is, in your conversations with business leaders in Australia, how has the recent COVID-19 changed the way people use Office 365 services? And where do you see the near-term challenges and obstacles? Over to you, Jeff. Jeff, you're on mute. Yeah. Thank you very much. There you go. So, yeah. look, look, I guess organizations are scrambling to, to uplift capability to support working from home, right? This is what's happening in the near term. We've got I guess big picture view, right? We've got telehealth stood up. Telehealth, you know, uh, has been something that the industry that we've all talked about for decades, uh, and it's never really been done in, in a big way. It's certainly need, it, uh, probably being done now with varying rates of success. However, you know, as I said, it's not been implemented for decades. Systems integrators that supply and manage desktops or remote desktop services are certainly hiring. They're hiring people at, to, you know, to really drive and help scale. Uh, you know, I'm seeing pictures of, uh, you know, WebEx terminals and, you know, video conferencing gear all packaged up and ready to go to various government agencies here in Australia. Uh, but, you know, really, if we get beyond the likes of Citrix and Microsoft and people who are helping scale up in that space, we can also look at things like BCP and DR. You know, BCP and DR has always been a topic, but you know, IT leaders, IT executives are certainly looking to organisations to help demonstrate that BCP and DR actually work together. You know, they're supposed to be two sides of the same coin. You know, some organisations have certainly sought funding and are prepared to support invasive change to uplift their capability. I think, you know, there's, there's normally a guy somewhere in the risk department, we'll call him Ricky in risk, and he writes a BCP policy. Uh, there's a DR element to that that talks about process and procedures to enact a BCP. Uh, certainly, in talking to enterprise architects, people in risk, and CTOs that I know, we're certainly hearing an increased level of anxiety about being able to bring something ahead. Uh, to be able to demonstrate that IT services can, in fact, be you know, remain resi resilient 
in a world with less people at work. Uh, you know, Office 365 and sales services, you know, Salesforce.com, Microsoft Teams, data is fragmented. We live certainly in a, in a fragmented world. I mean, who owns the data here? You know, quite honestly, you do. Uh, you know, SAS is not immune to data loss, accidental outages, malware, ransomware, and sometimes, you know, I guess services sitting in the cloud procured by a SAS type arrangement are seen as being out of sight and out of mind. You know, some SAS providers will retain data for the best part of 30 or, or 60 days. Uh, you know, they charge an arm and a leg to recover it or can't do a granular recovery. And that's something that's unique to us. It's something that, you know, we really support on. You know, it's often all or nothing. Ten to $20,000, you know, USD isn't out of the norm with 14 to 20 days to bring data back. Uh, you know, in the near term, uh, organisations, as I've said, are talking about uplifting their work from home capability. They want to do it securely. Uh, you know, the questions are, help me automate and reduce in human intervention. Help me automate change. Help me automate routine tasks. You know, I've, I've even seen organisations lately come and talk to us and say, we've got no people to manage and change tapes and tape libraries. Uh, you know, it's all right if you're a very, very large enterprise, maybe you've outsourced that, maybe you've got people sitting in data centres. But being able to feel confident that data can be, you know, present data can be persistent at the edge and in the data center in the, in the, and in the cloud is certainly getting a lot of interest right now. I hope I answered the question. Yes, Jeff, thank you. That, that is precisely what, uh, yeah, the, the, I, I mean, we are hearing this from everywhere, that how does, how does the overall working situation today impact our infrastructure and we are just at the front end of the curve, this might just go on for a few weeks, months maybe. And how do I make sure that, you know, we are not jeopardizing the future of these, these models? Hey, as we keep keeping this informal and just hanging out, can I, I just, thought, just thought of a couple of other things. Uh, maybe you guys would be yeah. interested to know, not so much about Veritas, but, you know, video conferencing. So WebEx adoption has seen about a seven times, seven fold increase in meeting minutes monthly uh, from Cisco. Uh, average monthly usage for uh, you know, compared to the standard profile of, of, of use, let's say, you know, was exceeded uh, in the first four days of April. Skype's up, they're seeing about 40 million users a month. Uh, Power BI from Microsoft is being used about 42% up globally by governments. Microsoft is giving priority to essential services and is said to be imposing limits on new resources for new subscribers. Yeah, Xbox gaming is being throttled during peak hour, and we're starting to hear similar moves from, from AWS. So just worth you know, giving you some data that I'm aware of. Oh, thanks, thanks, Jeff. And uh, th th these are humongous numbers, though in today's times, they're not surprising. So we have all, all in line with that. Brilliant. Uh, all right, so I'm going to go into the next question that we have. Okay, so the next question is, uh, do you have support for teams in Office 365? Now, I will probably answer that myself uh, very quickly. Uh, so as Ranga called out very clearly in the presentation that the Veritas Veritas backup offering covers the entire Office 365 portfolio. So this includes Exchange Online, this includes SharePoint, this includes Teams as well. So effectively, the entire Office 365 suite is covered. So that's, that's uh, taken care of. All right, I, I'm going to now move into the next question. And for the next question, uh, maybe Jason and I will get you back on, um, on the mic. Um, so the question is, as an Office 365 user and a backup expert yourself, uh, as an organization, what is in your opinion the most essential uh, factor for SaaS backup solutions. Over to you, Jason. Yeah, sure. So look, um, in terms of, I guess, SaaS backup, right, as, as we've discussed today, you know, the world's changed, you know, getting infrastructure on site to perform backups is, uh, you know, it can be a, a challenge or if you want to grow your infrastructure. So 
Yeah, as you move into the SaaS world into something like Office 365, where it's fully hosted by a SaaS vendor, um, to, to protect that data, you know, it's obviously makes sense if you can have a SaaS data protection solution that that aligns with that. So, you know, nothing to set up, nothing to um, to deploy, uh, and, and effectively you're just consuming a service. Um, obviously wrapping around like that all of the appropriate security and 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 requirements for manageable um, so look i think i think that's sort of where i would see you know with, with today's you know situation and um where we're at uh you know if you're moving heavily into the SaaS space uh quickly deploying that that office 365 capability or expanding some of the tools in that office 365 suite that you might not have used before such as teams um, you know, the ability to protect that data, meet your compliance requirements, uh, regulatory requirements, etc. You know, having a, a SaaS data protection solution that aligns with that uh, makes, makes sense. Brilliant, thanks. I uh, completely agree to the fact that, you know, a backup solution should be as simple as what the SaaS application or the workload is offering to the customers. So that's that's brilliant, Jason. Thank you. All right. So the okay. next one I have is yes. I guess there's a there's a question in the chat window. So um yes yes uh, there are a couple of questions on on the chat. Let me just take them in in that order. So the first one, if I have to quickly summarize, uh, and probably Ranga could answer this uh, for us is what is the key differentiator with Veritas solutions as compared to the other uh, vendors? So, uh, Ranga, do you, want to, do you want to take that one? Sure, definitely. Now, thanks for the question. Now, one of the key things that we've come up is simplicity. The quickness in which where we can set up the turnaround on to set up and actually see the backups in motion. So, that's the key takeaway here. Um, hosted service sets up in minutes, backup starts straight away. In fact, um, in one of the tests that we did, so for one of the customers, six minutes they were on, the first backup was on. From the time they started initially connecting to O365, provided the connectors, credentials, set up, backup was rolling in six minutes. So that's the key takeaway. So the protection is quick and the comprehensive data sets that are protected within it and the granularity at which you can restore that data. So all these are the key takeaways. That's where, where we are, that's why we are the market leaders in terms of those uh, functionalities. I hope that yes, answers Ranga, thank, thank you for that. Yes, and as, as you said, right, um, the unlimited retention and unlimited storage is something that comes out as, um, the key differentiator there where, you know, no on-prem storage or no on-prem infrastructure needed, just plug in. Now, the other factor that I have heard from my customers is the link between the data center and Office 365 is not a con constraint here because what the, the Veritas solution does is the backups are stream using APIs from Office 365 straight into the Veritas data center. So no matter what, customer data center uh, connectivity is with Office 365, that never hampers the backup part. Secondly, you know, the, you, you rightly nailed it, uh, Ranga, the, the, the wide support. Now, recently we just announced support for Microsoft uh, Dynamics 365, so that takes care of, uh, you know, the, the entire Microsoft portfolio, as well as, you know, support for G Suite and uh, Salesforce Cloud. That's, that's, again, one of the key uh, differentiators. Um, furthermore, and I think you had it in your slide as well, where we have a fairly flexible licensing model where we don't really charge for um, users who inactive. left the organization or in inactive uh, users. Yeah, exactly. So that gives you know a lot of flexibility of managing your cost point as well. So I think these are a few things that, uh, you know, we clearly know that these are dis distinctions or dis uh, differentiators uh, for, for the solution. And as a follow-up, we're happy to 
walk that through with a demo, um, do reach out to us and we'll be happy to schedule a demo for you. All right, I will um, now quickly move on to the next question. And, and the next question is, um, again, getting a little bit into um, Office 365 specifics, but maybe Ranga, since you're online, I'll keep, keep the, the ball with you. Um, why is legal hold not the same as backup? And Office 365, I'm, I'm sure this is coming in from the Office 365 uh, offering. Naga, do you, do you want to take that? Sure, definitely. Now, uh, great question. Legal holds, um, what is the primary use case of these legal holds? So ideally, it is for discovery purposes and you don't want users to purge certain data. So that's where legal hold comes in. And ideally, uh, you want to look at from an e-discovery perspective, right? And it is only for active users. That's where the legal hold is. So what happens when the users quit? So how do you restore the data? So Microsoft requires you to have an active user license to restore back the data. So if you don't have that user, so you, you can't restore that data. Now, uh, situations where users have deleted. For example, we had a situation where a SharePoint admin had deleted certain sites and this user had quit. Now, there was no way to restore the data in a granular fashion without a backup, a proper backup, because natively you can restore everything or none. So that's where things are. So when we look at legal holes, it's more for e-discovery purposes. And when we look at protection, it's for recovery purposes. So let's make that clear distinction there. And then uh, when it comes to data exports and imports, right? So making sure that all of your Office 365 is in uh, litigation holds kind of invali invalidates uh, this functionality. So having a backup would help you to get that recoverability in a granular fashion. Perfect, Ranga, thank, thank you for that. Um, that, that helps. Awesome. All right, so the next question I have uh, from the chat window is um, how to maintain uh, data security and productivity with remote users. Uh, Jason or Ranga, if both of you or either of you want to take a stab at this one. How to maintain data security and productivity with the rem remote users. All right, so um, Ranga, do you want to go when first? we talk about, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, when we say uh, data security, uh, this is, if you look at the, the blog, um, one of the slides there, I said, when it comes to IAM and client security, it is a combination of Microsoft and the consumer. So there is some part of use to play there in terms of maintenance of that. Um, so from a, a accessibility perspective, what we do is, we don't hold any data in terms of uh, credentials or anything. So we manage it through tokens. So we get the permissions and we go through the tokens to make sure it is communicating in a secure way through the API. So that's where um, uh, the data security comes into picture. Um, so other than that, uh, the rest of the security that you are maintaining or IAM functionalities is on the native tools. So. All right, thanks, uh, Ranga. Jason, did you have any additional comments? Uh, look, yeah, I don't, don't, I suppose the, uh, it's, it's, I guess it's a fairly open question depending on the context, right? But, um, you know, you've got the, the security itself, I guess, between the platforms, which you have, uh, as, as Ranga mentioned, you know, there's, there's various methods of encryption um, of the data in flight, there's encryption of the data at rest. But uh, you know, you then fall back to to what's the the user level security and what um, what you're trying to achieve from that. So obviously, you know, a lot of the SaaS tools today, um, you know, transmit data between the client or the end user and and the platform in a secure manner. Um, however, you know, do you know the question then becomes: Do you need to layer on? additional security requirements uh, as i mentioned before um, you know tools like data loss prevention for instance if you're trying to, uh, to to manage you know what data might be exfiltrated or um you know might be 
either maliciously or, or otherwise. Um, so, you know, you need to start to look at third party tools. Some, some of the, the cloud service providers like Microsoft, as I mentioned, do have um, some basic capabilities uh, that, that are add-ons for, for data loss prevention, um, or, you know, you might be looking at something like a, a cloud access security broker with third party tools from uh, Symantec, now, now Broadcom or McAfee or some of the other, other um, security uh, players out there. Um, I think Clear Swift and a few others. So, yeah, look, it comes back to sort of, I guess, your overall security posture. What are you trying to manage? What are you trying to protect from? Uh, what compliance do you need to adhere to or, or regulatory requirements? Um, you know, obviously, data protection is, is, is almost a given that, you know, you, you should have that as a standard. And, and then the question comes, you know, what other, what other security layers do you need to add on top of that? Brilliant. Yes, thanks, Jason. That 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 helps, and I I completely agree that you know having the right level of uh, control and our backs put in place will also help strengthen the entire security model. All right, brilliant. So with that, I am now going to move into the next question I have received, and that is uh, on on the chat window. Um, Microsoft now requires new organizations to turn on security defaults or pay for an Azure premium subscription, which blocks the legacy authentication that is required to distinguish between user and group mailboxes. How will Veritas programmatically calculate the user mailbox count for the per user license? Now, uh, I am going to uh, take a stab at this myself, but, uh, you know, Jeff, Ranga uh, or Jason, did you have any initial comments before I can, you know, put in my my view? Yes, I can. Um, so, uh, what we what we license is per active user. End of the day. So, what per user or license, as long as it is active. And what we use for authentication is, as I said, is a token based system. So, uh, it it asks for permissions and it refreshes the tokens. So every time there is a connectivity, it communicates over this legal token. We don't store any credentials uh, with reference to that Office 365 account. And there are certain requirements that needs to be a global admin account. So there are certain requirements for connectivity to O365. And um, so as long as it is a user, so there are many ways you can uh, bring in a user so you can select the user specifically or you as and when the user gets created an active directory uh, or Azure Active Directory. So uh, we can get that user there as long as the licenses are there, it would automatically manage that. So I think from a uh, uh, user perspective or a license perspective, it is fairly simple based on active user, active license, per user per license. Anything that you want to add a bit on top of it? Yeah, exactly. In, in line to what you just said, uh, once we have the active administrator token created and configured on the initial onboarding, we then have the clear visibility of users and groups within the organization uh, in, in Office 365. So that gives us a clear dif distinction between uh, users and uh, groups. And of course, this communication goes over the secure uh, graph API that Office 365 off offers. So that's where uh, the licensing model comes in. And yeah, I, I, I think we are in line with that. If there is, certainly if there is, you know, an additional deep dive needed, uh, what we are gonna do is as soon as we come to the end of our list of questions, we will share an email address or a contact point where you could, you know, reach out to us for details and we'll be happy to follow that up. All right, as I move on, I have a few more questions on the chat window. Um, the first one being, if licensed for active users, what happens to the data for the inactive users? And um, I think it's the next one is also a follow-up. I could have an inactive user for years and will I incur any charges? So I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so the way it works is we will, even if we don't have 
active users or if the user has moved on, we still continue to hold the backup of that particular um, user. And you know, the the license for that user could be reused for a different user altogether. So you would not incur additional charges if somebody leaves the organization and we can then reuse that license key. However, we will continue to hold the data for your retention principles or retention time frame just to make sure that it is in in the backup. Ranga, correct me in, if that's not the case or feel free to add. No, perfect, perfect. So inactive users data is retained as long as the retention selected for that particular connector. So if it is unlimited retention, it is held for unlimited period of time. If it is a limited retention time frames, it is there for those time frames. So which means you can restore back the data. Now, I was mentioning during my slide as well that you could also import it. For instance, a user might quit who is at a managerial level and a new person could take that person's post, which means there is a need for that person to read old business emails and we can help uh, provide that by importing the data from one mailbox to another. So from one inactive mailbox back up to an active mailbox. So that's also possible. So exactly right. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, thanks, uh, Ranga, for that. All right, I have one more question on the next one. Um, so we have a case where the files the files created by non-active user did not update. Do you back up all changed data in an Office 365 environment and the backup isn't based on the document creator? So uh, if, I, if I understand the question correctly, um, it, 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 you know, the, the question is around, do we back up the entire Office 365 tenant or how do we choose or is there a criteria for what to back up and what not to back up? So uh, let me let me start with this. Uh, so the way the way we operate in in Veritas as backup is effectively um, you know when we configure the backup we choose either we could choose a set of users we could choose a set of groups or user groups, or we could choose everything. Now what the solution does is we have a, um, a, you know, the backup regime or the backup policy will go and look at all the users that, or groups that have been configured for backup. And we will then go and individually pick up, uh, you know, objects within that backup um, uh, entity. So if that entity is, a user, we will actually go and start looking at uh, the exchange online data. We will also look at the SharePoint data. We will also look at the entire um, user data. Now, what happens, or this is where it starts getting interesting, is you know collaboration tools like Teams or collaboration tools for um, like like even SharePoint. Now, there is these being collaborative tools. It is important for us to know the other side if there is a chat communication happening between two people, we also need to know if the other entity is um, being backed up. So effectively, as part of the best practice, we recommend the entire Office 365 tenant to be backed up. However, we give um, a way to back up individual components as well. So uh, the, the license covers the entire uh, subscription. However, you know, it's, it's up to the uh, up to the uh, backup admin to decide what he wants to um, configure. All right, and uh, there is a further explanation on this question, which is, example, uh, a person A creates a document and then leaves the company. Their backup license was moved to person B. Person B used file for six months and then we restored it. It reverted to person A last used. In, in this case, given that person A was already backing it up, we will have a copy of that backup in, in place. And once person B has started to use that file, 
is when we will start backing up the file from person B. And Ranga, if I'm just interpreting this question online the same way as you are, then you know, you're okay. But if you have a different in interpretation, please jump in. No, perfect. So all I was saying is please leave so, that's a great uh, scenario that uh, you're talking to a person A creates the form and possibly it is protected and then it's moved to person B and the person B is using it. Now, if you restore, the question is from what point you're restoring. If you're restoring from yesterday, it will go back to person B because this file was modified by person B and it goes back to person B if you're doing a normal restore back to original location. But if you go back six months before snapshot, then it is looking at person A folder where it protected and it might go back to that original user. So it depends on what's the point in time that you're taking that restore from. Is it from yesterday or is it from six months? Because we can do both. So from which point in time you're trying to restore this? So it all matters from that point. I hope that answers that question. Brilliant. All right. And um, this, com this question comes in from Brendan. Brendan, happy to uh, follow up. Uh, I've just flashed up the um, in email that you can send us uh, a question and we'll be happy to you know respond and follow up as as needed cool. all right um, so i think we are coming to the last 10 minutes of the meeting and i have one more question to go and um, again a reminder to everyone please use the chat window to put in uh, your questions and you know, we might be able to take a few more questions before we sign off for today. All right, so the next one is, um, again, it, it looks like a big picture uh, question and more of a strategy. So I'm gonna uh, go back to you, Jeff, to take this question. Um, as, as a backup, um, as, as you can, just a minute, let me just zoom, zoom it, yep, all right. As Veritas is in the backup space for many, many years, uh, how do you, uh, or what do you advise the CIOs and CTOs uh, in in uh, the SaaS world? What what's the strategy looking like? Or do you just? Thank you very much. Uh, look, I think it's it's more than just about SaaS. I'll, I'll answer the question this way: Data in, t in today's world is is fragmented. You need to be able to talk to your own data management framework, right? Um, I'm not talking about you know something in a thousand feet that that, 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 a, that a sales organisation or a, a vendor may have. Uh, we have a very detailed data management framework uh, that that underpins part of our broader go-to-market strategy. But really, it's talking about everything from governance to interoperability, to security, to recoverability, to resilience. How do you actually understand the value of the data that you fundamentally have? So as an, organ as, as an example relative to SaaS, don't rely on any cloud provider to maintain your data. It's not part of their core service. Have a strategy to classify policy, I guess risk, compliance, you know, be able to visualize, so understand, is the data what I think it is? Can I look into that data? Can I use advanced algorithms to process that data? And make sure that you have a view of your overall data footprint. When you make decisions about what you use as software as a service, when you make decisions about what retains or what's retained in your data center, what key applications go where, how are you utilizing and providing IT services to the business? Start to think about the data and the value of that data, the information, broader value to the business that it provides. So, I, I mean, I personally think SaaS services are brilliant. I think they're great. Uh, you know, I've worked for many years with, you know, interacting with the likes of Salesforce.com, you know, other versions adapted from Oracle, Office 365 and others. It's just, I guess the message really is to technology strategists and, um, and CTOs understand the value that you have, understand where you put your data and make sure you can recover it and visualize it in a multi-cloud, multi-service, broader world. Thanks very much. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Jeff. And as we are on that, I have another question on the chat window. Just give me a second and I'm going to pull that up. Um, Apart from the licensing cost, is is there any other cost involved like storage uh, or, or for retention? So, so I, th I think Jeff has already answered that. Sorry, Jason has already answered that on the chat. But again, really emphasizing, apart from the licensing cost, there is no additional cost. Um, and since this is a completely hosted solution, the storage is all under the um, subscription cost and it's taken care of. So no, no additional cost there. All right, so with that said, I think we are at the end of the list that I had, and I'm also now flashing the email address where people uh, can get their additional questions. And um, that, that we, would, we would also like to see if, you know, if you have, and we are happy to keep this uh, much more uh, you know, dynamic and free flowing. So if you have any topics that you would want to have a discussion on, we are happy to, you know, take that as a feedback and then we go back and schedule that on our weekly meeting. So, so the next one is on the 15th of uh, April, we will have our communications come in through LinkedIn um, as well as through emails. So stay tuned and thank you all for your time today. And um, if, you know, um, let me just see if there is any other last comment on the chat before we leave, or given that we have a couple of minutes. Uh, Jeff, Jeff uh, Ranga, yes, go for it, Jeff. Yeah, look, again, this is the first time we've run one of these. It's a whole new world of working remotely. Uh, we thought we'd ground this with some form of presentation only for a few minutes that might resonate. But fundamentally, it's about hanging out with you. It's about being available to you. It's about asking technical questions. You know, challenge us. By all means, drop us an email. Give us some thoughts on feedback from today. Tell us how you'd like us to do things differently. This is just a different way of us engaging in a different time. So, yeah, quite relaxed, quite informal. Yeah, continue to reach out, please. Brilliant. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us today and have a lovely um, afternoon and hope you have a nice and safe Easter break coming up soon. All right. Thanks all. Thanks Bye. Nice. Bye. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.